everyone, and I'll call the meeting to order. Do we have an adoption of the agenda? Sorry, I looked at you, and I'm thinking, no, you can't adopt the agenda. <laughs> so moved. Thank you, Darlene. Um, today we are receiving a briefing on bait for the lobster fishing industry and the impact of the closure of mackerel and spring herring fisheries. And with us today we have Molly Elward, Executive Director, Melanie Griffin, Marine Biologist and Industry Program Planner, Laura Ramsey, Research and Liaison Officer, and Trevor Barlow, Fish Harvester and Co-Chair of the PEIFA Spring Herring and Mackerel Advisory Committees. And we can jump right into your presentation and we can hold our questions until the end if that works for you. Works great. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Floor you. is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to begin by saying thank you to the Standing Committee for inviting us here today to speak on this very important topic. Uh, my name is Molly Elbert. I'm the Executive Director of the uh, PEI Fishermen's Association. And to my right is Melanie Giffen. She's our marine biologist at the association. We also have Laura Ramsey to my left. And she's research and liaison officer with the PEIFA. We're also pleased to have Trevor Barlow with us this morning. Trevor is a volunteer representative with the association, and he currently sits as the chair of our Spring Heron Advisory Committee, as well as co-chair of the Mackerel Advisory Committee. And Trevor is an experienced captain with 24 years of experience fishing lobster, herring, mackerel uh, out of Howard's Cove. So we're here today to speak on behalf of the membership of the PEI Fishermen's Association on the topic of bait in the lobster fishing industry in relation to the recent federal decision to close the mackerel and spring herring commercial and bait fisheries. The PEIFA represents uh, 1,275 representatives, independent core fishers that harvest in PEI, all of whom were impacted by these closures. We represent the independent core fishers who depend on the commercial herring and mackerel fishery for their main source of income each year. This has been a devastating and direct blow for these fishers. The burden of uncertainty towards the future of these fisheries weighs heavily on them, particularly with no plan in place to reopen. Over 950 of our members are actively fishing lobster now in PEI in lobster fishing areas 24 and 26A. And as local and affordable bait becomes more difficult to access, the overall price and availability of bait becomes a growing concern for many of our members. Harvesters on PEI have had the ability to fish for their own bait for decades, enabling them to keep costs quite manageable. Some fishers will fish bait nets during the lobster season and even more fish mackerel, typically using hooks in the summer and fall and freezing it in local storage facilities as a cost-effective means to acquire bait for the upcoming season. season. Although the commercial and bait fishery for spring herring and mackerel have been closed, the need for bait has not changed. Harvesters have heard that there is enough foreign bait available to fill that gap. The problem is, is that the foreign bait may have negative impacts on the ecosystem. Although we do not have a recommendation on how to solve this problem, besides reopening the mackerel and fishing herring, uh, and herring fisheries, the PEIFA feels this is a major concern moving forward. We know that rock crab is a major prey species of lobster outside of the fishing season. Added pressure on the stock reduces the availability of natural prey for the lobster population. There will also be increased pressure on other limited bait available, such as silver sides and gasparol, to fill the gap in this local bait. Removing access to local herring and mackerel bait sources has significantly increased the economic burden on fishers. With, with new fishers purchasing fleets at soaring prices, coupled with recent and significant increases in fuel costs, more financial hits to their business can be devastating. Bait expenses for an individual lobster fisher during a two-month season on PEI can vary depending on uh, a variety of factors. In speaking with our committee rep representatives and also our board of directors, um, an average expense this year for bait alone is between twenty dollars and $40,000 plus for each fisher. Many have told us that the price of bait <clears throat> has increased further since the beginning of the season as local frozen supplies have continued to dwindle. Fishing your own bait can cut that cost significantly, with some estimating the cost of fishing your own bait could equate to one-third to one-half of the cost of purchasing bait. So it's significant. 
With no local bait in stock, another concern from fishers is the increased dependency this would create on their fish buyer to consistently supply them with bait. Would fishers take a lower price for their product if they knew this would, in, this would secure access to bait? The closures have led some to question whether there will be days in the future where some fishers are not able to secure bait for their lobster fishery. Bait supply and affordability remain a consistent concern since the closures have been announced. For some fishers, this is a transition year with over 2.5 million pounds of frozen herring and mackerel in storage at a local storage facility in eastern PEI. Some can utilize the bait, uh, which some have utilized the bait from last year, uh, which was frozen locally and then used this year. Without a change to reopen the mackerel bait fishery this year, fishers would face further hardship in paying more for bait imported from elsewhere. Local bait is received, sorted, and packed by local employees throughout the summer and fall each year. These jobs will be lost this year without changes to the local bait supply. The economic importance of the local bait fishery cannot be understated. While we discuss the importance of maintaining local bait sources, we also want to incorporate the need to do so sustain sustainably in a sustainable manner, developing, realisting, rebuilding strategies to ensure a healthy stock and a viable local commercial and bait fishery for generations to come is key uh, to our members. We have some uh, recommend recommendations that I'll, I'll go through as well. So the following recommend recommendations center around supportive action, potential collaborations, and enhanced dialogue with all impacted parties on the future of bait in the lobster fishery and PEI. Number one recommendation, support for the reopening of a conservative and sustainable inshore commercial and bait herring and mackerel fisheries. Commit to a thorough review of the herring and mackerel recommendations submitted by the PEIFA and other fishery stakeholders. Their recommendations involve restrictions in fishing effort, improved and increased data collection and sampling, a targeted action plan on the overpopulation of seals to address significant increases in predation, and discussion on initiating license buyback programs to permanently retire licenses and begin to rationalize the fleet. Recommendation number two, support of the collaborative development of the realistic rebuilding plans for both uh, spring herring and mackerel. These fisheries closed without proper rebuilding plans in place. The urgency is there. Timelines and plans have, been forth have not been forthcoming to date. We request support in prioritizing this process. The PEIFA has 22 internal advisory committees comprising of over 200 volunteer fishers who put significant time and effort into providing valuable feedback on fisheries management, conservation, and science. Our members and representatives have the expertise to assist in the development of realistic plans that incorporate growth with measurable outcomes alongside conservative and sustainable fisheries. Targeted action addressing the overpopulation of seals needs to be the primary focus of a rebuilding strategy of our small pelagic and groundfish stock in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence. All platforms available to our association have been used to communicate our frustration, recommendations, and our collective industry support for targeted gray and harp seal population controls. The recently released Atlantic Seal Science Task Force recommendations are aimed to increase seal diet, and distribution data collection, seal predation research, and increasing industry involvement in seal science. We recommend provincial governments review these recommendations and develop a means of supporting these recommendations moving forward. Rebuilding plans for these stocks are doomed to fail without addressing the seal population. Number three. Support in reopening bait fisheries, which in turn allows fish harvesters to collect proper samples, improve spatial and temporal data collection, as well as maintain the level of fishery-dependent data needed for stock assessments. By removing all heron and mackerel fisheries, DFO removes major stock assessment data sources used to evaluate the health of the stock. DFO has stated that closures will be revisited following the next stock assessments. Without these key data inputs, we are not confident the upcoming stock assessments will provide any type of solid, accurate advice on the future of these fish populations. 
Furthermore, the lack of funding sources towards baseline research on these species is evident as fishing industry associations are being asked to bear the additional cost of, of adequate sampling in the absence of fish, fishing activity. The provinces has, has cost-shared herring projects in the past, and we request similar collaboration investment in herring and mackerel data collection and research moving forward. There is a need for additional research in herring and mackerel, which is currently limited by DFO funding sources. One example for spring herring is using aerial photography to locate and quantify spring herring spawning activity. We request provincial support and expertise in the development of an expanded, localized research initiative such as these in conjunction with the fishing industry and with DFO. Recommendation number four. Request for funding and support for increased freezer and storage facilities across the island. Funding and support would provide flexibility for fishers to purchase bait in bulk and continue to store it for themselves. Additionally, the province could assist in securing bait at a reduced rate to further support the fishers. Allowance of fishers to purchase and store their own bait alleviates the challenge of being committed to one buyer. Recommendation number five. Request for fishing industry representation and participation on the federal provincial bait working group, including updates on the previous eight months of the working group's activities and documentation. A federal and provincial bait working group was formed in the fall of 2021, well ahead of one of the biggest decisions to impact the bait industry in Atlantic Canada was announced. This working group was also formed without any fishing industry or stakeholder input or participation. The fishing industry has been advocating their concerns regarding bait since as early as 2016. During the time, DFO, uh, the DFO Southern Gulf uh, Lobster Advisory Committee meetings, no forum existed to specifically discuss, discuss bait challenges, collect pertinent information on bait, and formulate plans to address critical challenges on this issue in the years to come. The PEIFA had been advocating for a working group with discussions ongoing with DFO. Bait didn't specifically fall under lobster management, and it didn't align with herring or macro management either. We were surprised that a working group had, be, had recently begun without the fishing industry involved. During the most recent DFO Southern Gulf Lobster Advisory Committee meeting in December of 2021, the working group was introduced and fishing associations immediately requested to be included and asked for information on the goals and the objectives of the group. To date, requests for fishing organization participation have remained unanswered and little information on the working group has been forthcoming. Recommendation number six. Request for foreign bait to be regulated to protect the Gulf of St. Lawrence ecosystem. Foreign bait is usually assumed to be bait that originated outside of Canada. Any bait introduced to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, not native to this ecosystem, should be considered foreign. Introduction of foreign bait into the Gulf creates concerns around the introduction of invas invasive species to the Gulf, as well as concerns around the health of any species eating the foreign bait. Both could be detrimental to the Gulf of St. Lawrence ecosystem. In Maine, there is a law in place to protect uh, Maine from foreign baits that are harbor and potentially, um, potentially introduce disease and pests and cause harm to aquatic populations and or the public. Maine's Department of Marine Resources provides approved contractors capable of evaluating this, and one of those approved contractors is based here in PEI. The province of PEI could start developing an approved bait list for PEI to protect the Gulf of St. Lawrence's ecosystem. Recommendation number uh, seven, request for alternative baits to be regulated and researched to protect the Gulf of St. Lawrence ecosystem and to, show, and to shore, ensure this is a viable alternative to, to traditional bait. Alternative bait could include foreign or local fish, fish byproducts, fish byproducts, etc., molded into a form that can be e easily used in traps. Foreign fish could be included, and therefore the request, the request in number five applies for regulation. Ingredients, although proprietary, should be regulated by either DFO or a third party to ensure there is no undersized fish, illegally caught fish, or 
fish treated, um, treated fish such as antibiotics are included in that mixture. The province of PEI could coordinate additional work to better understand and refine alternative baits. Additionally, they could complete unbiased catchability research to determine alternative, if, if alternative bait is working as efficiently as traditional bait. Provincial support for research of seal byproduct in bait alternatives. The ecosystem of the Gulf of St. Lawrence is heavily weighted towards seals. In an effort to balance the ecosystem, a reduction in the seal population is an unpopular but necessary conversation. PEI has the advantage of developers of bait alternatives on PEI, and the PEIFA believes this is an opportunity for the province of PEI to support efforts exploring seal byproduct as an ingredient in this alternative bait in the form of funding and expertise. If this option is successful, it tackles two major issues, lack of bait as well as an overabundance of seals. Recommendation number eight. Coordination of perch bait fishery development in collaboration with the PEIFA. Fishers and PEI have been requesting permission to use bait tags on perch traps as an alternative safe bait species. This requires providing data on variables like size and maturity to DFO to start the development of an emerging species license. This license will assist DFO in gaining a better understanding of the stock to assess its sustainability. Preliminary work has been done on the viability of perch as a bait species in a master's thesis completed at UPEI. Through this study, there is also work done on modified and acceptable perch traps. The PEIFA have already chatted with scientists as well as conservation and protection officers at DFO to discuss initial steps of data collection that would be required. The province could coordinate data collection and meetings with P the PEIFA and DFO to advance the process de of developing a perch bait fishery. That concludes our recommendations. And again, we'd like to just thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak about this very important issue. And we're open to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, Rob? Quick. Uh, I guess from my end, I uh, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to ask some questions on this because in my district, I've had a few people uh, raise uh, an awareness of the issue and how they've been impacted on it. But um, one, one comment that I had from one uh, particular bait fisher, and his comment was is that it's a fishery, it moves around a lot. And you talked a bit about trying to have some cameras to try to identify the volume of fish that might be out there. So his comment was is that they're never in the same place every time. And he, his comment was that there seemed to be a fair supply of herring and mackerel uh, for bait. And uh, he's obviously being impacted on this. But maybe you could address that on, on how big the shortage is, or do they move around, or are we just, are we just not finding them, or uh, uh, they're not in the same place every time, just to give me some sort of a sense of how accurate the science is. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and then maybe and maybe the fisher could identify <laughs> that even better. Trevor? Yeah. This this mic is working. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'd agree with your your assessment, Rob, that they do move around. And we actually had a call with science and Laura can mention it a what a week and a half ago about we were doing acoustic surveys for science. And they actually had a, an independent pilot send pictures of into DFO thinking it was pollution. And this happened uh, west of the bridge, I believe it was a two mile area. They thought it was pollution. They sent these pictures, and maybe the province has received some too, thinking it was pollution. But when they sent technicians out, it was actually herring spawning. So there is, the fishery is rebuilding, but we cannot get that drove in that science is missing something somewhere. And I keep alluding back, and you, uh, many of you here probably remember the riots in Surrey they do, uh, yeah. when, the, when the seniors moved in, in 2003. And if you look at the science documents in 2003 to 2006, you can see the collapse of the fishery. Well, they never go looking there to see what's there and why the fishery collapsed. They always go to the gas bay, the same place every year after year. And that's the definition of insanity, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's evidence. There's evidence there, but it's to get it through somebody's 
I guess, get it through the right channel to get it there. And, and I, I have to agree. Rob? So to add to the equation, I didn't talk a little bit about Maine and some of their issues that they're dealing with. So I'm assuming that they're fishing the same bait type of fishery. What, what are they doing that's different than what we're doing? Are the, or are they have any restrictions on it? Because I'm assuming uh, fish don't understand where boundary lines are and things of that nature. So I just want to get a bit of a sense of uh, other jurisdictions uh, besides uh, just what uh, Canada is in the southern Gulf. Do you want to talk about so um, the herring, for instance, uh, is local to the Gulf, but the mackerel, um, actually there's, a, what, there's two contingents of mackerel on the East Coast. There's the Southern contingent of mackerel and the Northern contingent of mackerel. And the one that, that uh, reproduces in Canada is the Northern contingent. Um, and you're absolutely right, they do not know boundaries. So they reproduce in the Gulf um, in the summer months, and then they make their way back to the US in, during the winter months for overwintering. Uh, the difference is, um, in the U.S., there is no minimum legal size on mackerel, um, and uh, they have a fishery that's open for a longer period of time. At one point, they focused more on their southern contingent, and now they focus more on the northern contingent because the population for their southern contingent has dwindled. So 50 to 75 percent of what the Americans are catching are actually Canadian contingent fish. Um, so we do have two different fisheries, but we are sharing a stock. I can't speak to their herring fishery and how they do that. Um, I can only speak to the mackerel side of things, but that's what we know of the mackerel um, is, is the way they do it, so. Rob? So that has to be, for Trevor, that has to be a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow when, when fish are different rules in different jurisdictions and uh, that there wouldn't be some sort of a multilateral approach to uh, conservation of a, of a particular species. And uh, um, so I'm just kind of wondering what your thoughts are on that, Trevor. We've been pushing for 10 years, and we've been asking, we've been begging for DFO to raise the minimum size on mackerel to meet European standards. Like the European mackerel fishery is booming. It's very abundant. And we've gone nowhere. And look where we are today. Mm -hmm. But, and who, do we, who, do we, who gets the blame? Me. The fishery. The fishery. But, but we have an actual, and we can go through, we can present the papers to show you where we've been begging DFO to raise the minimum size to fix the fishery, because we're the first to see it. We're the first to see a decline in the fishery. We're the first to see a rebuild in the fishery. It's here, right here in PEI. We will be the first to see it. Mm -hmm. Rob? Um, I might ask my colleagues to the left to oh. probably close Sorry. their ears on this subject, but I want to talk Rob, about this. Um, I think I just wanted to mention as well is that, um, as, as Melanie mentioned, Atlantic mackerel in Canada is completely closed. Yeah. So all of uh, Atlantic Canadian provinces, all the fishers, there is no mackerel fishing other than recreational, uh, which is open and a contingent for the live bait fishery. But um, in the U.S., uh, that is still open. So they are still fishing right now, and they still have a quota. Um, this year. So as Canada takes these precautions, the U.S. continues to fish the same fish we're trying to protect. So, so you can imagine from a fisher's perspective how frustrating that is, coming in with these recommendations time and time again and, and not getting any headway. And, and really, you know, I think there could be also uh, further collaboration with the U.S. Uh, on this, and there really has to be moving forward. But I just thought I would mention that because it is kind of two different things with herring and mackerel, but mackerel, you know, is Atlantic Canada-wide closures. Rob? So the issue uh, that always, my time as a Minister of Fishers, it was brought up just with every uh, minister's meeting that we had was the issue around the seal population. And uh, I've, I guess I've argued many times that there needs to be something done on that regard because it is, uh, uh, it's kind of tipped the scales of the ecosystem towards uh, that particular predator. And, uh, but I, I get the arguments from a, you know, a trade issue where, you know, the subject of seals gets very uh, hotly debated. But I, th I guess my argument has always been is that there's got to be ways to utilize it. So you're, you're talking about there may be some uh, uh, opportunity to use seal for bait. I, I would even argue that there should be opportunity to use seal for food. Uh, not necessarily for fish, but for human consumption. If I think of the North, I thought that was a fairly staple part of their, their diet. And uh, I guess when we were actually in Ottawa a couple of weeks ago, we attended a, a seal uh, 
meeting and uh, they showed some samples of food uh, sealed and it was actually quite good actually. Um, so is there any thoughts or any discussions going on around uh, like a food harvest for seals uh, just like any other fishery? I think that's more of a question, Laura. Um, I think that's an excellent question, and I think the timing is right right now to um, approach that subject. Um, there was a recent recent um, uh, report released by the Atlantic uh, Seal Science Task Force, um, which was made up of industry representatives, including myself. And part of that discussion has it it, it was the opportunity to have the discussion without being shut down. So I, I find that has been an obstacle um, because of the trade issues and because it's been a delicate subject uh, for a lot of years. But I think the timing now with the minister releasing that a public forum would, would be taking place in Newfoundland this year. And I think there's opportunity for provincial governments to be involved in that discussion. And that discussion is going to involve not only science, which was kind of where the task force originated, but also these opportunities because I think that development and that marketing is taking place. I think now is the time um, for everyone to kind of look at that and there seems to be an appetite to discuss that further. And I know even within the PEIFA, um, we've kind of taken on a, a couple more ac actionable roles in trying to push uh, that along further. So I think it's just initiating, but I think the potential is there, and I think that's uh, important to the membership. Rob? Uh, so would you recommend that the province of PEI uh, put together a, a business plan for a, a, a seal harvest that includes a meat and bait potential usages of the, of the uh, product? And, and I guess my other question is, how, how many seal fishing licenses are there or seal harvesting licenses are there? I, I'm aware that there are some. I don't know how many um, currently. Well, I think there's around 20 okay. uh, licenses, and uh, many of those haven't been active for a number of years. Yeah. And seal fishers also um, go through um, extensive training as well mm -hmm. um, in humane harvesting. Um, so there's, there's potential there, and that's more so the side the PEIFA is working on, and, and I can allude to, to Trevor as well, but I think that would be a good recommendation from, from our membership to continue that, uh, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I can ask more, but maybe if others want to chair, uh, and I'll yeah. come back to me later. So. Ola? Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for your presentation. It must be absolutely devastating, in particular for the fishermen that that mostly fish bait. I was wondering, uh, are there any kind of support programs that in place to to uh, keep those those uh, bait fishers uh, going uh, since their their livelihood has pretty much disappeared. There's been discussion on on different types of. Um Compensation. I mean, that's been discussed at different DFO levels as well, and recommendations made. Uh, but there has nothing been. There's nothing in place to date on on that. Uh, I think part of um, the discussion um, we've been having is on what plans are in place. I think it's that anticipation. Is there going to be a fishery reopen, and when? And when are we going to be looking at that? So for those harvesters, it is really hard to predict whether they'll be they'll have an income next year. Um, but as far as I'm, I'm aware, there's no supports in place for those fishers. Ola? So, uh, so mackerel and herring are fished for other reasons than bait. Um, I know the, the herring fishery, they, they used to fish them for the roe, for instance. And so can, do you know what share of the total catches are used for bait compared to other uses? That's a good question. I'm wondering if Trevor might have taken well, a stand at that, especially the involvement over the years. Well, over the years, the uh, the fishery has changed from, a, I don't know what you call it. We used to fish and they'd go to the smokers and, yeah. and the row processing. But the fishery has dwindled so small that, that most of them businesses are closed. And it's just a prior, all the last few years is, been bait. Like, there's, it, I mean, the bait is the big industry, the big driver. That's all it was. You know, there wasn't a, enough volume to run a processing plant. That's how small the bait, uh, the spring herring fishery got before they closed. Ola? 
Uh, so I have noticed actually with astonishments the few times I've been on the wharf that uh, frozen bait imported like from Japan or places like that can be seen. Uh, can you tell me how much of an actual problem it is and, uh, and what kind of procedure would have to be in place to make sure that you don't import whatever, whatever it is that's dangerous? I presume it's primarily um, parasites, for instance, that uh, would survive freezing. So I, I think that's the main question. You know, we have the same question. Um, we don't know exactly what it would entail, but it's been developed by Maine. And like I say, there is a um, contractor here on PEI that we could very easily have a conversation with and find out the details of, of what goes into determining safe bait uh, when it comes to foreign baits coming in. Um, but you're right, we do, con we, we worry about parasites. Um, we worry uh, even, you know, certain baits can come in if they're frozen because maybe that freezing will kill the specific parasite that's in that fish. But it's determining which parasites are in there and determining which factors are, or how they can be effectively um, um, destroyed before they're introduced to our ecosystem. Um, and the, like we mentioned, the other aspect of that is, um, for instance, we got, a, we got a phone call from Norway and they have all kinds of redfish heads that are available if you want to purchase. And so one of my first questions was, are they treated? And they're treated with red dye. We have no idea if, if fish in our ecosystem eat that, how that could affect them. The same if it's from a fish farm and it's been fed antibiotics. And the lobster eats the antibiotics and then the public eats the lobster. So those kind of steps need to be taken to better understand um, what's being brought in for foreign bait. And uh, we have capabilities right here in PEI to, to accomplish that. Ola? So, aside from worries about foreign bait, uh, is there an adequate supply of it? In other words, if you could import the baits is, uh, on the world market, uh, enough of it around for lobster um, fishermen? I believe that is some of what the Bait Working Group is working on, understanding the availability globally of, of what's out there. Um, but as, again, we're not privy to the information that comes out of the Bait Working Group, so I couldn't tell you. Ola? Oh, uh, just uh, one last question. Uh, we actually went to visit the, uh, the bait, local bait factory uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I was wondering, given that they can get the materials to put, you know, they need fish or fish uh, waste as well, um, can they ramp up to fulfill the need, or would it be a major industrial undertaking to provide enough bait from of that kind of all fishermen? I think it would be a major industrial uptake for them to be able to manufacture that much. Uh, the other question still remains about the um, effectiveness of the alternative bait versus the natural bait as well. So um, <coughs> fishers will always pay more for a, a bait that is effective versus a bait that's ineffective. So we have to consider both of those and thinking about that alternative bait. So, so it's a question of the loves of what they like. Yes. Okay. Oh, good. Good. Well, uh, I'm good for now. Thank you. Uh, Darlene? Uh, thank, you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Trevor and Melanie and Molly and Laura uh, for coming in. Uh, it's great to hear from you. Uh, you mentioned that Maine has a law in place uh, regarding bait and uh, where it comes from. And I'm just wondering how they uh, you know, implement that law and regulate where the bait is coming from and you know, <laughs> who, who would oversee that? Is it through the state or, um, you know, is it's, there bait police? <laughs> it's through the, the, well, I'm not sure to be, to be honest, I, I think those are very valid questions. Yeah. Um, I'm just aware that they have an approved list and anything that's imported needs to be um, on the approved list. And it is the Department of Marine Resources that um, provides that approved list. So some more research I think would have to be done in the background to see how they actually implement the whole process. But yeah. Darlene? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, that would be, you know, as, as, as government, you think about how we can actually enforce, uh, you know, having bait regulated. Um, and interesting conversation around the seals, too. I don't know. I mean, there are plenty of them down where I live. So, um, you know, that's anecdotal. But as we talk about, uh, that's part of the, the problem, I think, you know, when you look at certain areas and, and uh, continue to look in that same area to, to get your data, that could be a concern. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether we can, we could move forward on on that using you know seal meat and and uh, also using you know some of the uh, 
uh, byproducts for, for bait. Um, and again, you know, is that a conversation that's had through the federal, you know, through DFO with government, or you know, how would we, how would we go about that conversation? I guess would be the, as far as the problems. Yeah, um, I, again, kind of back to the timing right now with the federal mm -hmm. fisheries minister and the announcements she's recently made, and I think she's extended the olive branch to the provinces mm -hmm. to become involved. When it becomes that trade issue, you know, no one wants a single target on their back, but as a collective, the Atlantic provinces together and the federal government, I think, you know, there could be some real change and, and real shift in, in the conversation as well. Not seeing this as, as um, you know, reducing the populations, but really utilizing something that's, that's readily available here in the Gulf. We have one of the biggest gray seal populations in, in the world. And um, with over half a million gray seals and, and eight to nine million harps. Um, so, you know, there's, I think the timing is right. Mm -hmm. And I think both levels of government need to be involved in order to make it work um, in, in so many different levels. Darlene? I think, sure. Well, I, it, it's an interesting conversation. And, uh, you know, I look at it as how can the province get involved and how can we help lead this through. With, with DFO and with the, the PIFA and with the fishermen uh, to find a solution because we know it's imperative that um, we find a solution. I, I f I'm sitting here thinking I feel like I'm having kind of the potato wart conversation but now it's fisheries with, you know, bait uh, in a different way but still, you know, the federal government regulating something that, you know, we have no control over and is very impactful to the province. So I'm interested in, you know, how we can move forward with conversation, so I'll bring that to the minister for sure. So, anyway, that's all I have. Thanks for coming in. Thank Hal? Um, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you all for coming in today. And it was a great presentation. I uh, really like the fact that you gave us recommendations and then expanded upon each one. Um, that helps a lot. A um, few questions uh, have already been asked, but the bait working group. It's made up of both federal and provincial representatives. Do you know who's on there representing the province? Dave McEwen. <laughs> okay. He just walked in. Right there. Perfect. Yes. Okay. He's actually the co-chair. Okay. Um, so there's no no um, f Fisher on that committee, is there? No. Okay. Um, so there was discussion on on alternative baits and what bait is most effective. I believe the fishermen know what bait works. Um, they're the ones that are out there on the, you know, I was going to say in the field, but actually on the water. Um, and so they know that, you know, obviously mackerel and herring are probably two of the best um, sources, or not sources, but um, baits to be used. What has been the response for alternative baits as in, like, say, the, the sausage that's out there now? What's the feedback you're getting from fishermen? Um, yeah, I'm going to Ask Trevor if he's going to be. I do have some, but I'd rather hear if Trevor's got some. I do have some feedback that I heard, but. I have my own mm -hmm. opinion on it, if you want to hear my own, because I, I tried it two years ago when mm -hmm. it was first being introduced. I have never tried it again, so that should give you an indication mm -hmm. of what happened. I've heard in the meantime they've changed their recipe, and maybe, I don't know. But. And that's exactly why I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear from a fisher who actually gets out there on the water, who's using it to trap, and that's they know it works, right? Don't work. <laughs> yeah, and by my understanding is the alternative bait now being used, I think it's about 25% mackerel in it, in the current recipe. So what's going to happen down the road? How do they access or source mackerel? Right, so um, this is part of the, the recommendation as well, because it is 25 to 50%, my understanding, mm -hmm. of their recipe is mackerel and herring. So they're affected as well. But um, my understanding is they'll have to get that mackerel and herring from other sources now as well. So it'll be, again, possibly foreign baits coming in and being used within the alternative bait, mm -hmm. um, which still raises the additional questions about the health of the ecosystem. So, Hal? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, and that does raise a concern too, because I'm, in, I'm, I'm concerned about the economic part of it. I mean, the lobster fishery, let's say, specifically in the lobster fishery, that's a huge economic driver on Prince Edward Island. I know in my district it's probably 80% of the local economy is driven by the fishery. Um, and so it's very important that we um, do everything we possibly can to keep it sustainable and viable. 
and bait is a very important part of that because I mean in order to catch them you have to have good quality bait um, what so the effects right now so let's how many licenses are there for bait fishers on Prince Edward Island um, I think it would be well the majority of, of lobster fishers on the mm -hmm. island would have that bait, bait license so I think we're talking upwards of 900 okay. licenses uh, probably on the island and how, how? many of those would um, use the bait fishery as their main source of income? I'm, I'm not sure on that mm -hmm. information. Um, we probably have to go back to um, DFO to, to discuss uh, discuss that one further. I'm not sure. Okay. Trevor? Trevor? J just a point of clarity maybe for Hal that bait license is not a form of income. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're, we're getting a commercial fishery and a bait light fishery confused maybe? I don't know. Bait license is not an income because you can't sell it. Mm -hmm. It's personal use. And I guess I should have changed no. the terminology, but those individuals who use, uh, who fish for bait as a living. Oh, okay. I know. apologize. Okay, <laughs> yeah. It was the way I worded it. I, but yeah. basically, so individuals, fishers, who, who their primary income is derived from the bait fishery. So that would be like the island of the commercial? Those individuals who, fishers who put nets out to catch mackerel and herring to sell to lobster fishers, let's say, to use as bait. I, we're not, I'm, I'm, we were asked this this morning mm -hmm. uh, just as we sat down, yeah. and that, so I don't, I'm not 100% sure on that. Trevor, do you have an estimate maybe from your end? No. Okay. We can, we can I, get it, back to you on uh, that, that answer. I could give you a, a number, but I, it wouldn't be accurate because there's licenses out there that aren't being used, they mm -hmm. haven't been used, so you can't, you know, like, I'll use the bot license buyback and the lobster fishery, all them bona fide licenses are out there that still have bait licenses attached to them that are, have potential to be used, so there's probably 40, okay. but maybe only five are active, I don't know, like, I don't know how many active ones there is. Hal? Thanks, Chair. And that's what I was getting at. I wanted to know how many, though, basically were active and how many people make their primary income from that fishery. Um, because I did ask, I had some approach me, um, asking me if there was any supports out there for them because this is now closed down, so they had, that's, that income is gone. Um, and I've asked a couple of times during the spring session um, to the provincial minister if there would be any supports for those particular individuals and also if there would any, be any supports for the increased costs and sourcing for lobster fishers who, um, who are impacted by this. Um, has there been any discussion with the association with the provincial minister on those supports? with the provincial minister. I know we sent recommendations into the federal, right. mm -hmm. but I don't think that no. we had sent any into the, the I, provincial. I don't believe so, but we have had discussions with the federal minister on a couple of different occasions um, in terms of uh, yeah, a need for some kind of a support. Al. Thanks, Chair. And what is your, I guess I should say what your feeling is, but what do you think the outcome might be of those discussions? <laughs> Maybe that's I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, did we ever get responses from the letters on from the federal minister on support? Uh, nothing specifically in terms yeah. of support. No. Yeah, no. Still a work in progress. Hell. Apparently. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I'm going to jump a few, just a few other things. So you mentioned on, the, and I think Rob was asking this about the. Uh, you talked about the northern and the southern from, from let's say, mackerel, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of looks right now where in Canada, they're kind of like the nursery, <laughs> and they're sending the stock down, you know, to when they grow to down to the U.S. for them to, they're getting the return on it, and Canada's getting nothing on it. So it, it really is unfair. And I'm not sure, again, going back to DFO and conversations they're having with um, foreign countries, in particular the U.S. on this, um, is there much push from, I guess, from DFO to, to the U.S. to change that? 
Yeah, so um, we've been sitting, and Trevor has been with us at mm -hmm. the AMAC table, which is the Atlantic mm -hmm. Mackerel Advisory Committee, mm -hmm. um, for years. That's where uh, we usually make our recommendations. Um, and we have talked at that table about having a joint um, management plan between Canada and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Some of the concerns that I think both countries have uh, in relation to that is once that joint management plan is in place, it doesn't go away. So we'll be locked into that um, permanently in the future. Uh, and so if the population comes back and we want to manage separately, then that's gone at that point. Um, so there have been discussions. The other thing that I will say is that when it comes to a stock assessment, mm -hmm. uh, we do have uh, the stock assessors from the U.S. on mackerel come to Canada mm -hmm. uh, for our stock assessment so they can peer review and vice versa. So the Canadian um, scientists go to the American stock assessment as well and take part in that. So they are talking, the conversation is open between both countries. Um, and I believe that Canada did put pressure on the U.S. when they closed the fishery here to make an effort in the U.S. as well, but they never followed suit with that closure. Well, thank you very much. It's, Al. Thanks, Chair. It's very concerning. Um, so back to, uh, I guess, I understand these um, issues are primarily uh, at a federal level with DFO, um, but the province does have a role to play in it. What conversations has the association had, had in, with the this fishery with, with the moratorium on mackerel and herring and the impact it has on uh, the fishing industry on in Prince Edward Island, what conversations have has your association had with the minister provincially and what supports um, has he offered? I haven't been on any of those. Were you on any of those? No, no. I haven't been. No. There has been discussions. Um, mm -hmm between um, the board of directors and Minister Fox mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I think the department's quite aware of the seriousness of the situation. Um, we have been looking for support to reopen the fisheries. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we outlined as well in, in this um, briefing today some of the ideas we had uh, around where we could use additional support from mm -hmm. that department. But I don't think we've had any okay. direct, that I know of, like meeting directly to sit down and speak about mackerel, correct? With the province? No, I, no. no, unless there there has been maybe perhaps with the president of the association and, and okay. minister but, directly. Al. Thanks, Sharon. That's really concerning to me that our provincial minister of fisheries over a serious issue like this that has a huge impact from tip to tip hasn't really reached out um, to the association. Um, Anyway, I guess I'll leave it like that. Thank you. Michelle. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks for being here today to, uh, to discuss this. Um, and I would, act I would concur with that. Um, so has the per province heard these recommendations? Yeah, so any of the macro ones and herring ones that go in to the, pro to the, to the federal government, um, we usually send them off to the provincial representatives as well, and the, the province also sits at those same tables that we do, mm -hmm. um, so they would hear our recommendations during those large meetings, um, the representatives from the province would. Michelle. Oh, I let just one sec. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I was just going to follow up to that. So typically when we make our recommendations to these advisory committees, we also send in letters directly to the Minister of Fisheries federally. Mm -hmm. And every time we do send those recommendations, we're always CC'd. And probably some of you are CC'd as well um, in some of those recommendations as well. We try to, you know, spread the word on uh, both federally and provincially on what we're recommending and why. Michelle. Okay. Thanks. And so it sounds like no response, though. That would be a courtesy, especially to ask to review any of your recommendations and what portions of them could be covered off from a, from a provincial um, action, right? So a couple questions that I have. Um, so one of the things that was, and you brought it up in your presentation, and it was raised to me by a couple of fishers who, sorry, I'm trying to get their, their words. You had brought up um, often, there's some fishers that are tied to their buyers to buy bait directly mm -hmm. from their buyers. Do they have opportunity to buy from anybody else other than their buyer, or is that like a monopoly? That's not off to Trevor. Trevor. Very good question for Trevor. I'll, I'll answer it the best that I can. Yeah. For myself as a fisher, I could have pallets of bait delivered from the freezers in New Brunswick. 
quite a bit cheaper, but I got no place to store it. So it, my alternative is I have to order my bait the day before, or the morning, when I go fishing, yeah. for the next day. So when I come ashore, I'm pretty well tied to that buyer to sell my product so I can have bait to go fish the next day. Versus where if I could order and have it deli delivered to me by the pallet or by bulk, mm -hmm. bulk orders, which you can buy cheaper than, mm -hmm. but I, there's no possible way to do that the way we're fishing sure. now. Right. Thanks, Chair. And is there, a, is that, does that impact pretty much all fishers or is there certain areas in the province where they would be able to order in bulk because let's say the freezer, they have freezer availability or something like that available to them? Yes, yeah, so some fishers have freezer or rent space in freezers, but, yeah. you know, not, I mean, if we all done that, there'd be no space to put the lobsters. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so around the, I'm, I'm curious to go back to, the, obviously this didn't close overnight, right? So there would have been signaling throughout the last number of years that this was going to be an issue and we, you know, take steps as we're moving forward. So has there been any, like when we talk about the alternative baits and, and stuff like that, has there been any action from provincial governments, because that would definitely be something that they could take the lead on, has there been any action from the provincial government to work on research studies and those kinds of things on alternative baits? Like I know Baitmasters has gone out and done that. In 2019, they did a, as you had said, they had done a, a pilot research project. The, um, the associate professor at the department, of, or sorry, at the vet college said it seemed that, you know, it was between the two different traps seemed to be the same, if you read through like what his analysis was. But has the province taken any steps to actually do research into what that would have to look like? No, and, and to speak to that paper as well, I've read the paper myself because mm -hmm. it is, of course, of interest to our organization. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of variables that are not reviewed in that paper. Right. Um, so I, I think that uh, the comment that we make about further research being required on catchability rates is a very valid one um, because there's things that, are, in, in my opinion, are missing from that research that was done. Uh, catchability is very hard to understand in the wild. Um, the direction of the tide, the direction of the current will all affect the catchability of the lobster in those specific traps. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I do feel like more research needs to be done, but I do not know of any instance where the province has ste stepped up to do any of that research in any mm -hmm. province, not just BEI. Michelle. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And, and that would seem to me like a logical next step to do a terms of reference and to identify what needs to be researched, right? And what, what needs to be considered in a project like that. Because if this is the way that we're going and if one of your recommendations is that we look at an alternative bait process, regardless of who's doing that, you would think that there would be immense dollars put into those that research. We do it with other industry, primary industries, like if this was a, like a potato industry, for instance, we would, you know, support that and wrap around, or I think we would. Um, and we've seen lots of dollars put out in order to do that. So I'm surprised that the province hasn't actually become a partner in order to do that kind of study with you, but there's been no action towards that. Okay. Michelle. Thanks, Chair. Um, and just another, uh, around the, and I understand it's it's a, a Canadian-U.S. relationship, a lot of this would be, but around that closure of us closing, but them not closing, it's funny because you, you know, sometimes it's like you imagine there's this wall and the fish never pass it, but that's not actually true. And uh, so do you know, are you privy to any conversations that happened with Canada and the U.S. around that and why that closure was not a joint, um, a joint decision? No, we know that there were conversations, but we don't know details of the conversations. Michelle. Thanks. Um, and for Atlantic Canada versus like the main lobster industry, is it like, is there a huge difference between the two as to um, revenues and incomes between, like, what we would see here in Canada versus what they would see down in the States? And forgive my ignorance, because I don't know. Um, but would it be a certain worth a lot more dollars in the States than it is up here, or would it kind of be equal? Um, for clarity, do you mean the lobster fishery? Yeah. 
So it's hard to say, I don't have the numbers, but the one thing I will point out is they, they have a completely different management plan okay. in the U.S., so they fish year-round with oh. 800 traps per fisher. Oh. Where here we have two yeah. months and two to 300 traps per fisher. So okay. it's hard to, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges because I'm not sure. Annually, we'd, you'd have to look at annually, but yeah. they fish very differently. Michelle. Okay. Thanks, Chair. And so that obviously, that management plan down there puts a lot of pressure on us here given the the shared waters, right? Um, so the other thing that I wanted to just ask was about the size of mackerel. You had brought that that up um, and you raise the size of the, min raise the minimum size of the fish. And so who makes that decision? And is that a U.S.-Canada decision? Or is that a, we can decide that in Atlantic Canada and... It's a, it's a DFO decision, and it is not a Canada-U.S. decision together. So in okay. Canada, um, we're at, I, I opened up our recommendations here, so I had them, um, to see if I could find the minimum size. So we're at 268 millimeters right now, um, which does just reach L50, which is that size at mature, 50% mature. Um, and that was only recent that we made it to that. Uh, but in the U.S., there is no minimum size. Okay. So they catch it all. But the, the request that, that the PEIFA, the harvesters themselves have put together, um, there's about nine or ten recommendations that have been submitted for the last ten years. And wow. one of those one of those recommendations is increasing that minimum size to 300 from 268 to increase the eggs in the water yeah. and hopefully improve that population. Michelle? Thanks, Chair. And has there been any discussion with DFO on that? Have they ever come to the table to have that discussion? Did you want to touch it? Or they just ignore it? Like, has it been ignored? It's, I guess now they're going to study it <laughs> after 10 years, in, but yeah. I okay. guess a lot of it comes around in the trap fisheries and the senior fisheries that I guess if we fish too big a fish, it'll put them out of the industry, I don't, which I don't understand myself. Like, I really don't understand how it will put them out of the fishery. We're all out of the fishery now, so, exactly. you know, the alternative is looking better every day to go to a bigger fish. Yeah. Michelle. All right. No, I don't have any other questions, just a comment. I find that really disrespectful that, you know, for 10 years you've been making this recommendation because you've seen what's going to potentially happen and trying to make it more sustainable and you put forward those recommendations, but they have not been addressed. And I... I'm sorry to hear that because now here we find ourselves in this situation when there was so much lead time leading up to this of, of actions that probably hindsight should have been taken and that the support wasn't there to actually take those actions. So, and now here we are. So I don't have any other questions, but I do find that disturbing to hear. So, Rob? Uh, just to talk a little bit of maybe alternatives or options a bit, and once again, my time as Minister of Fisheries at meetings, the, the discussion of redfish quota has always been raised, and PEI has had a historical history in the redfish quota. Is there any, is the province making any lobby to try to expedite that, uh, that uh, fishery to be revisited and to allocate a certain amount of quota, and can redfish even be used, uh, like the byproduct of redfish uh, harvest uh, used for bait? Mm -hmm. um, so it can be used for bait, okay. um, and it has been in the past. Yeah. Um, it's local, it's within the region, so uh, it's, it's considered safe. Um, and the PEIFA has been successful in the past of um, getting the experimental fishery for redfish in the, was it two years ago? Yes, yeah. Two years ago, and we applied again. And we have it this year as we well. We have it this year as well, yeah. But I think the, the challenge there is that it needs, the requirement for the experimental fishery is that it can't be used for bait. Right. We can't sell it and use it as bait for these experimental fishery. Mm -hmm. well, what can it be for? <laughs> Human consumption, I believe. Oh, okay. But yeah. you, you can't eat the whole redfish. I mean, there's parts of it that would be... I mean, I wouldn't be saying taking away the, the, the edible parts from human consumption, but the remaining byproduct you'd think would make a decent bait. Yeah. So, um, agreed. I just, I don't know. Uh, I think the other part of your question was what the province was doing to assist with that. and. I don't believe Molly can answer this better, but uh, in that process, has the province been involved in the process? We've been working with, uh, with the province and other partners in PEI in terms of uh, um, making recommendations to DFO uh, around redfish as the biomass grows. 
um, and becomes available for so for uh, um, allocations in 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 the provinces in Canada. So we've um, we've submitted. Uh, we've recently uh, received some feedback in terms of um, uh, notes from our meeting, but we're still waiting to hear um, what 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 they've heard basically from all of the partners. Uh, Rob, but but you'd think that, like I say, my understanding is my time as minister was that that fishery was close to getting to a point of a, a sustainable harvest, and uh, I'm just wondering if there could be any. You would assume with a dedicated minister of fisheries and PEI, mm -hmm. there would be lobby to say mm -hmm. we've got a problem with the bait fishery here. This is a possible option. Is there anything that the federal minister can do to expedite uh, a, an actual commercial fishery and? Uh, PEI being getting our fair share of whatever that resource is. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm just a little surprised. I'm assuming the PEI FA would be also advocating for that as well. A absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And I, I believe the biomass is growing a little bit slower than they had anticipated, so um, it still could be a couple of years off. Okay. Rob? What about other species? Like uh, striped bass is another example mm -hmm. that kind of comes to mind that, that was, you know, there is a small commercial harvest, I think, over in the Miramichi, but. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a possible option now? I know, I think they eat lobster, so I'm not sure if lobster <laughs> might, might want to have some payback here, but. <laughs> yeah, you want to go for it? Well, it, just to say that our members have been bringing up all these ideas <laughs> oh. and, and striped bass for a number of years now, too. There's also a process that you have to go through. Um, you know, we mentioned about perch, and that's something we've been, you know, working on for the last few years. There was some research done a, a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in order to be able to pilot that project um, or, or at different gear types as well, um, there's a series of processes you have to go through, Section 52s, for example, um, which are federally, uh, and bringing together all those partners. So it is a, a, a big initiative, and that's why we mentioned Perch on here particularly. Uh, it had unanimous support from all the lobster advisory committees and the board. Um, so those are great ideas and things that our members have been bringing forward, and any type of support to get those um, you know, really rolling at the federal level uh, and different research initiatives um, to make sure that what we do harvest is sustainable as well. We don't want to start something and, and yeah, not be able to continue exactly. it, right? So uh, that type of provincial support in that regard would also um, help. I don't know, Mel, do you have anything? Well, I just wanted to add that on the striped bass one specifically, it's still listed on the endangered species list. I know. <laughs> yeah, so that's the challenge we run into with that one. Um, we need to get it off the endangered species list before we can set up a, a real commercial fishery for it for bait. Um, I think we have a little more leniency on perch, but we need to collect things like size of maturity and that kind of information and report back to DFO on that so that we can get an emerging species permit um, to actually start to, to give it a go. But that all takes time and manpower and money. Uh, to get all of that done, so. Rob? And, and I guess that's why I, we, I think as a committee we want to invite you in here, was to give the opportunity to raise your voice a little bit further and, and hopefully, I, I know Dave's taken diligent notes there and I'm sure that there's DFO representatives that are watching here as well, so uh, that's part of our objective, I think, was to try to get a better briefing and understanding of the challenges that the fishery has regarding the bait fishery, but also to give everybody an opportunity for the voice to be heard for options. Uh, the other one I wanted to talk about was the, the gray seals issue, because I think it was recently I was reading something about the, that the, actually the gray seal population was having dramatic effect on the yellow tailed flounder or something like that. And uh, so that kind of gives me a, you know, but, but where is the science in saying or the common sense in saying that you're, you're actually, uh, Enhancing one species at the at the uh, that this has happened naturally, it's, you know, at, at the uh, loss of another particular species. Like, like, where's the common sense and where's the advocation from both the provinces and dedicated minister of fisheries and DFO to come to some sense of uh, common sense in some of these things? Oh, I, I think this one particularly has been really frustrating because this is something we've heard from members for years. It's a recommendations we've been making, um, you know, and I, I think it was. 2012, maybe, when um, Minister Shea had come forward with um, uh, the idea of, of a reduction of 75,000 at the time. And, um, you know, those recommendations were being made at all the different advisory committees, what fishers were seeing on the water in that predation. And it wasn't until, I think it was 2019, where DFO came out with a paper um, recognizing for ground fish, for example, for cod, Atlantic cod, a reduction in the seal population of about 65 percent 
would maintain the level of Atlantic cod we have in the southern Gulf. Just maintain it. And, and it's not at a great level right now. And it's actually um, in that discussion, in that paper, um, looking towards the word of extinction, you know, by 2040, potentially, mm. under 1,000 tons. And so that paper came out in 2019, and there's still been relatively no action on this one. But it's, it paints quite a story about Atlantic cod and other ground fish like flounder that you're mentioning. So you can, you can tell it's a frustrating one, and one that's taken a lot of time. And um, I guess we're hopeful now that, that um, the conversation is brought up again, and um, both federal and provincial ministers, um, or federal and provincial departments are hopefully going to keep this conversation going. And yeah, any support we can have towards that after a long time of, um, of discussing that would be helpful. Rob? I'm somewhat reminded of the Yellowstone show there. Was, I guess it sort of somewhat depends on how cute the uh, species is that you're trying to save, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, just the, the final comment. It's more a comment more than a question. I, I certainly appreciate the PIFA for coming in here, but I also want to appreciate that they actually took a fisher with them. And I think that we have a lot of uh, associations and groups that actually come and meet and present to us here, but to actually take a, you know, the, the real live fisher <laughs> to, to uh, answer some of the questions and put their, their sense to the equation, uh, I really appreciate that so so comments and kudos to you Trevor <laughs> thanks Rob uh, Ola uh, thank you and thank you so much for providing this really detailed list of recommendations and I note uh, and I can't remember all the details but it seemed to me there was a fair proportion of them that could be done by the province without as usual waiting for the federal minister to do something so I urge the minister to consider all those things she can do. Um, I was wondering, I was astound, astounded to hear the amount of bait. There's a 500 pound per boat per day type of thing. So how, uh, how many lobsters, how many pounds of lobsters eat that 500 pounds of bait? Uh, does it all get eaten in the trap or does it just get wasted? That's a great one for Trevor. <laughs> Every day is different. Yeah. <clears throat> Obviously, there's more than just lobsters that yeah. eat that bait. There's crabs, there's perch, there's there's everything. And sand fleas. It's, okay. yeah. it, it, a lot of days you go out and it's just bare spikes. Yeah. That's what's left. Ola? So I appreciate that you're concerned also about what the lobsters eat since, you know, it goes into the lobster, eventually goes into us when, when we eat them. Um, so... And now I also would like your suggestion about about incorporating seals. Although I have one concern there, um, I've noticed uh, I'm a I'm an experienced eater, and I've noticed, for instance, that sometimes you get chicken or eggs, for that matter, that taste of fish, which I presume is because they eat fish food. So I am uh, I'm wondering, you know will the lobster taste of seal, which has, to some people, a very strong taste. So, as a final remark, I want to volunteer myself. I'll be happy to <laughs> taste the lobsters to see if they taste of seal. But uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we need an answer to that. <laughs> I think it's a great suggestion. <laughs> Out there. Um, so I just have one more question to follow up on the bait and the bait regulation. Who actually sets the regulations of what bait can be used? Um, so in Canada, there's none. There's no regulations in Canada on what bait can be used um, besides, you know, what they're catching themselves and can put on the spike on the same day. Uh, it's the U.S. and I believe it's the Marine, uh, the Department of Marine Resources in Maine that created the approved list. Um, and maintain that approved list in Maine. Okay. Uh, Michelle? No, I don't think I have any other questions. I was curious on that. Thank you. Okay. That exhausts my list for questions. Um, no more? No more questions? Do you have any, I guess, closing remarks you'd like to make before we move on? or Just to say thank you for inviting us. We're uh, pleased to be here. Thanks for your time and your interest. Thank you, and we, we appreciate all your time. And thank you, Trevor, too, for coming in. Um, I guess before we do, do we have any new business? Or otherwise, we can just roll right through. All right. No new business. A motion to adjourn. Thank you. Al.